in the middle of the vast Pacific Ocean, about as far away from anything and anyone else, lies a tiny speck of land that has once again captured global attention. Buried within endless pages of a bankruptcy court filing, a loan memo revealed the ambitions of one company and its billionaire owner to purchase their very own sovereign nation, the Republic of Nauru. The blueprint, reminiscent of a plot from a bad supervillain movie, aimed not only to exploit the island's legal status for corporate benefit, but also included plans for constructing a human genetic enhancement laboratory and a massive underground bunker capable of withstanding, quote, some event where 50 to 99.99% of people die. The intended survivors would be members of the philosophical movement known as Effective Altruism, employees of the company, FTX, and the billionaire himself, Sam Bankman Freed, formerly the richest person under 30, who today faces up to 110 years in prison for defrauding over 1 million people. Nauru's allure wasn't just in its isolation, but also in its palpable desperation. For two decades, life on this remote island has been marked by hopelessness. A quarter of the population is engulfed in poverty, and there was a time when unemployment was a staggering 90%. The island is strewn with dilapidated homes and eroding infrastructure, while rusting cars and rotting garbage lines the country's only two roads. As the nation's once fertile interior has given way to a desolate moonscape scattered with bizarre, razor-sharp gray coral spikes, the reliance on imported processed and canned foods has led to a dramatic decline in health. Currently, the country holds the grim distinction of having the world's highest rate of diabetes at approximately 40%, the highest obesity rate at 71%, and the lowest life expectancy in the Pacific at just 64 years. Today, the economic outlook is so bleak that mass relocation of the entire population to elsewhere is a genuine consideration. But things used to be dramatically different. Less than 50 years ago, Nauru wasn't just prosperous, it was the single richest country on Earth. With a per capita income of $31,000 in 1975, a number likely to be underestimated, the average Nauruan was four times richer than the average American. Despite there only being 15 miles of paved roads, sports cars and Land Rovers became common family purchases. The police chief famously imported a yellow Lamborghini only to discover he couldn't fit in the driver's seat. Residents lived in large ranch-style solar-powered homes and regularly chartered flights for shopping trips to Singapore, Fiji, and Hawaii. A Nauruan guard reminiscing about the era stated, People would go into a shop, buy a few sweets, pay with a $50 note, and not take the change. They'd use money as toilet paper. Living was so cheap and money so plentiful, it became optional to work, to which many seized the opportunity. So how did this tiny Pacific island become the richest country on Earth, only to lose not just its wealth, but potentially even its land? This is the odd story of Nauru. Today's video is sponsored by War Thunder, the definitive vehicle combat game that boasts over 2,000 planes, tanks, ships, and helicopters, each crafted with meticulous detail down to the individual components. Whether you prefer the thrill of a quick skirmish or the strategy of a methodical engagement, War Thunder offers a PvP mode for every type of gamer. And for those who share my passion for military history, you'll find an immersive journey through the evolution of combat technology from the pioneering days of the 1920s to the advanced military tech of modern warfare. So experience War Thunder today for free on PC, PlayStation 4 and 5, or Xbox One and Xbox Series X and S using my link below. For new recruits or those returning after a break of at least six months, using the link unlocks a hefty bonus pack featuring premium vehicles, a premium account, a unique 3D vehicle decorator, and many more surprises. But hurry, it's a limited time offer. In 1830, a cargo ship, the John Bull, disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Its last known location was Norfolk Island, an isolated outpost nearly 900 miles off the Australian coast. 
This island, notorious as an English penal colony, was a dreaded destination for the most hardened criminals being shipped to Australia. Among them was Irish convict John Jones, who, along with several desperate prisoners, took control of the ship in a daring escape attempt. What followed was a 2,000-mile voyage into the Pacific that quickly spiraled into a nightmare. As their supplies depleted, most of the crew met a terrible fate. Jones and his accomplice, Patrick Burke, consumed them. The journey reached its end on the shores of ironically named Pleasant Island. Spanning just eight square miles, this raised a toll roughly a third the size of Manhattan had been home to around 1,400 natives for over three millennia. These resilient people made their homes along a 150-yard-wide coastal strip, a cooler refuge rich in coconut groves that encased the island. The island's most prominent feature, locally known as Topside, is a 200-foot-tall plateau that occupies 80% of its landmass. This dense, forested highland provided the natives with wild almonds and breadfruit. To supplement their diet, the natives cultivated fish in Buwata Lagoon, the island's only fresh water source, and ingeniously trained man of war hawks to fish in the surrounding ocean. But despite the idyllic image of Pleasant Island, life here was precarious. Frequent droughts made water scarce, dangerous currents surrounded the waters, and tensions among the island's 12 clans occasionally threatened to erupt into violence. This, however, was rare. The harsh realities of the island necessitated cooperation, fostering an enforced, albeit fragile, peace among the inhabitants. This began to change with the arrival of the Europeans. Integrating himself within the local society to survive, the marooned convict John Jones facilitated trade between the natives and passing European merchants. The island's excess food was exchanged for tobacco, liquor, and rifles. Jones was eventually banished from the island after killing a dozen other European fugitives before blaming their death on the local chiefs. But by introducing weapons and alcohol to the island, his arrival shattered the island's peaceful coexistence. By 1878, a drunken dispute spiraled into a decade-long civil war that would see the island's population nearly cut in half. The German Empire seized this opportunity, kidnapping the chiefs and using them as hostages to confiscate almost 800 rifles, nearly one for every remaining islander. Shortly after, Germany annexed the island for themselves, but from now on it would be known by its local name, Nauru. In 1899, within the bustling Sydney office of the Pacific Islands Company, an employee named Albert Ellis noticed a strange rock being used as a doorstop. Inquiring about the rock, he was told it was just an ordinary piece of fossilized wood from Nauru. But after three months of daily encounters, he took the initiative to remove a piece for further analysis. It turned out to be phosphate ore, the highest quality ever found. Two years later, on a trip to assess the commercial potential of the deposit, Ellis not only confirmed the purity of the phosphate, but also discovered that nearly the entire island was made of this valuable mineral. Strategically situated along the path of migratory birds and devoid of natural predators, Nauru became their favored resting and breeding grounds. Over millennia, the birds, whose diet consisted of nutrient-rich marine organisms, eventually deposited enormous quantities of bird poop, known as guano, onto the island's surface. This guano then soaked into the island's fossilized coral limestone, solidifying into a blanket of 84% pure phosphorus that covers all of Topside. The timing of this discovery just so happened to be at the peak of a half-century-long worldwide guano rush. Its unique mixture of nitrogen and phosphorus made it the ultimate natural fertilizer, the discovery of which revolutionized agriculture and was perhaps responsible for 50% of the global population's food supply at the time. The company immediately began negotiating with the German government to start mining. Shortly after, the process of turning Nauru into fertilizer began at a dizzying pace. Doing so was messy. Miners would clear all vegetation and then the topsoil before scooping out the phosphate rock, which was wedged between 30-foot-tall spires of ancient coral. 
left behind was what National Geographic described as a ghastly tract of land, which was rendered completely unproductive thereafter. By the early 1920s, 200,000 metric tons of phosphate was being exported every single year, but the island was no longer controlled by Germany. Following the First World War, Nauru became a League of Nations mandated territory, jointly controlled by Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand. On paper, this meant it was supposed to be developed and protected from exploitation. In reality, the island became an Australian mining colony. Mining was mechanized, new rail lines transported the rock to the coast, where huge cantilevers poured it all into a never-ending line of cargo ships. It was then transported and sold to the three ruling nation's farmers at prices well below global rates. This, however, came crashing down with the start of World War II. In August 1942, Japanese forces landed on the island and for three years ruled with unimaginable brutality, defined by mass drownings and the deportation of 1,200 Nauruans to be used as forced laborers. Only 745 ever returned alive. Immediately after the war, the phosphate industry was rebuilt and annual exports surpassed all-time highs by 1948. Over the next two decades, approximately 35 million metric tons were extracted, which is just shy of the combined weight of all cars in Australia today. While the extraction of phosphate in Nauru was exploitative, Nauruans by this point were receiving 9% of the phosphate revenues as royalties. Despite these revenues being limited due to the sale of phosphate at below market prices, they were substantial enough to prevent the local population from needing to work in the mines. The labor force was primarily composed of Chinese workers and later those from neighboring Pacific Islands. These arrangements brought a degree of modernization to Nauru. Schools and a hospital were built and the population grew accustomed to modern consumer goods. However, this advancement was eclipsed by significant environmental degradation, which left a third of the island barren by the late 1960s. In response to this devastation, Australia proposed relocating the entire population to an island off the coast of Queensland, a suggestion firmly rejected. Amid this turmoil, the drive for Nauruan independence intensified, spearheaded by revered chief and Japanese forced labor survivor Hammer de Robert. This movement, bolstered by the global push against colonialism and pressure on Australia, culminated in Nauruan independence in 1968. The new government purchased the phosphate assets, transferring control to the state-owned Nauruan Phosphate Corporation. At last, all profits and all risks were now the Nauruans to reap. As Nauru stepped onto the world stage as the newest and third smallest independent nation, it faced limited options. The continued extraction of phosphate was an obvious choice, yet it was clear that the deposits would likely be depleted within a generation. Agriculture was out of the question as the previously fertile lands had been turned into a man-made desert. Fishing in the surrounding waters was never productive enough to be competitive, and the island's small size and remote location made the establishment of a manufacturing base impractical. Faced with these constraints, the Nauruan government decided to focus entirely on accelerating phosphate extraction before potential competition arose elsewhere. The expectation was that the revenue generated would be substantial enough to not only sustain a comprehensive welfare system in government operations, but also allow for significant investment in preparation for a post-phosphate future. They were right. With the phosphate now being sold at global prices, along with new methods for increasing purity that opened up additional uses in industry, Nauru was slammed with a tsunami of cash averaging over $100 million a year. As planned, the government embarked on a worldwide investment frenzy, pouring hundreds of millions into offices, hotels, resorts, apartments, and housing developments in Fiji, New Zealand, Hawaii, Guam, Australia, Samoa, and the UK. Additionally, they acquired phosphate mines in India and the Philippines to expand their market share. A state-run airline with seven passenger aircraft 
a cruise ship, and half a dozen merchant vessels were launched to diversify the economy. By 1975, Nauru boasted the world's highest GDP per capita, with a phosphate income of nearly $1.3 billion adjusted for inflation and a sovereign wealth fund valued at nearly $200,000 per citizen. For the population, this was the golden age. If you wanted a job, you were guaranteed employment in the government, featuring high wages, lengthy lunch breaks, and minimal responsibilities. By 1998, only 4% of the workforce was outside the government's payroll. If you wanted an education, the government would pay for you to study abroad in Australia. If you got sick, healthcare was free, including trips to see specialists abroad. Prices were subsidized to such a degree that telephone services, electricity, and housing all cost just $5 a month. There was no income tax and no import tax, meaning frozen meat from Australia was cheaper in Nauru than Australia itself. Many chose not to work at all. Although not every family was wealthy, all lived comfortably. Health declined due to poor diets, high rates of smoking, and excess drinking. But at least healthcare was free. Other industries withered away, but at least you were guaranteed a job. Phosphate mining may have kicked up irritating dust and polluted the fresh water, but at least the government was doing everything to ensure life would continue like this forever. The prevailing attitude at the time was captured in a common now ruin saying that translates to, tomorrow will take care of itself. In January 2003, Nauru's telecommunication system collapsed, rendering the country completely cut off from the rest of the world unless ships with satellite phones were in port. This meant that when the president gave a speech declaring that the country was on the verge of bankruptcy, was unable to send their sick to Australia, could not pay public servants' wages, and desperately needed emergency aid, it went unheard. What could have possibly happened in just two decades for this to be Nauru's situation? Over the course of the 1990s, phosphate exports steadily decreased until deposits effectively ran dry in the early 2000s. By 2001, revenue stood at just 5% their 1970s peak. This development, anticipated for nearly half a century, was not unexpected. The plan had been for Nauru to smoothly transition to depending on its sovereign wealth fund. Based on conservative estimates, the fund should have been valued at $10 billion, allowing the country to maintain a level of prosperity akin to that experienced in the 1970s purely through interest income. However, by 2004, the fund was worth at most $40 million. The problem was that Nauru's investments were built on bad advice and mismanaged, while capital was continually siphoned away due to inefficient spending, propping up failing government enterprises, and in some cases outright theft and corruption. From 1975 to 1987, Air Nauru made losses totaling a third of the country's phosphate revenues. Planes often flew with crew outnumbering passengers, and sometimes having no passengers at all. As it turns out, not many people wanted to fly to the middle of the Pacific to see the leftovers of industrial phosphate mining. When they did, routes were often redirected and cancelled when the president wanted to go somewhere. The famous Grand Pacific Hotel in Fiji was bought, immediately closed, sat idle for renovations that never occurred, and then was sold back at a tremendous loss. Other bizarre investments included the financing of a West End musical in London about Leonardo da Vinci's love affair with Mona Lisa. It was cancelled after a week when everybody hated it. Few, if any, investments ended up being profitable. Most operated for decades at a financial loss. So as investments went belly up, phosphate revenues plummeted, and government spending to support the welfare apparatus increased the country was quickly heading toward collapse. All was worsened when it was discovered that hundreds of millions of dollars were being embezzled by government workers and international conmen. For the first time in its entire existence as an independent nation, the government began to seriously consider and discuss alternative development plans, only to find out that no viable long-term solutions were available. Decades of the government providing high-wage, low-skill positions and subsidized prices on everything distorted the incentive structure. 
since there was little benefit to developing marketable skills or receiving an education, there now existed a severe shortage of skilled human resources necessary for developing a new economy. Left with little to no other options, the government began to explore less ethical ways of obtaining money. Nauru began actively promoting itself as a tax haven and a hub for dubious offshore banking activities. By the mid-1990s, it had licensed over 400 foreign banks, allowing operation without a physical presence on the island and without any obligation for record keeping. In 1998, the Russian Central Bank Deputy Chairman claimed Nauru Banking had nearly destroyed the Russian economy, as $70 billion had been smuggled out of the country by the Mafia. Combined with Nauru selling diplomatic passports to anyone that wanted one for a few thousand dollars, including terrorists, the island quickly drew the ire of the international community. By 2002, the United States went so far as to use the Patriot Act to ban American banks from transacting with Nauru institutions, imposed sanctions, and threatened to repossess Air Nauru's last remaining aircraft which ironically had just begun to make a profit. Forced to crack down on both activities, the government resorted to selling all its overseas investments to account for the now massive budget deficit. It then began borrowing extensively while draining its own central bank's reserves, leading to its insolvency in 2004. Nauru was now a failed state by every dimension besides widespread violence. Total GDP collapsed by 90% and per capita income was now just $2,800. 80% of the island was an ecological graveyard, and government wages were behind by half a year. Since most were employed by the government, austerity measures caused unemployment to hit an unimaginable 90%. Unpaid medical bills to Australia meant it was now exceedingly rare to get adequate health care. As the last aircraft was stranded for a month in Australia due to unpaid maintenance bills, the provision of fuel and essential goods was cut off. Once again, it was suggested that the wholesale relocation of the island's population was the best course of action. But just as all hope was about to be lost, a very unusual last resort appeared. In the early hours of August 24, 2001, a 60-foot wooden fishing boat with 438 Afghan asylum seekers on board became stranded in international waters. The MV Tampa, a nearby Norwegian freighter, responded to their distress call and rescued the refugees. International maritime law mandated that the survivors be taken to the nearest port, which was 90 miles away at Australia's Christmas Island. The Australian government, however, refused permission to do so. With the captain unwilling to transport the refugees elsewhere, a physical standoff threatened to escalate into a full-blown political crisis. That was until Nauru agreed to house the asylum seekers in a detention center while their claims were processed. This arrangement, known as the Pacific Solution, involved Nauru housing future asylum seekers intercepted by Australia in exchange for significant financial support. Closed in 2008 but reopened in 2012, the Regional Processing Center has received international and local criticisms for severe human rights violations, but for the Nauruan economy, it has been life-saving. The government estimates that the direct and indirect revenues from the center constitutes 58% of its total revenue, amounting to approximately $3.3 billion since 2001. Along with the selling of diplomatic recognition for cash and debt forgiveness, an influx of foreign aid from Australia, an increase in revenue from selling fishing licenses to other countries, and a slight renewal of phosphate exports from secondary deposits, Nauru's economy has seen a rebound over the last decade. With current plans to begin controversial operations to mine the seafloor for rare earth elements, the government hopes to make Nauru rich once again but the nation's future prospects remain precarious. Fundamentally, its economy is essentially reliant on Australia keeping the Pacific solution alive. But with political unpopularity and the fact that it's costing Australia half a billion dollars a year to maintain despite housing only 22 asylum seekers today, that appears uncertain at best. 
should the funding cease, an economic crisis will assuredly recommence, plunging the population further back into poverty. In 1962, the UN offered Nauru this cautionary message. This picture of peace and well-being and security is deceptive. Indeed, it is a false paradise, for these gentle people are dominated by the knowledge that the present happy state of affairs cannot continue. In modern history, no other country has been as richly endowed as Nauru in terms of natural resources per person and per square foot. As such, no other country has exemplified the resource curse so aptly. At the dawn of its independence, everyone knew, the foreign governments, the Nauruan people, and their leaders, of the economic pitfalls that laid ahead. But without robust institutional guardrails to guide financial management, in the absence of a government transparent enough to account for every penny spent, and with no clear plans for establishing an alternative economy in a post-phosphate future, Nauru's fate was sealed. As rising sea levels threatened to submerge all but its barren topside, Nauru's story ultimately underscores a simple yet profound truth. Building a rich nation demands more than just money. Don't miss out on War Thunder, the definitive vehicle combat experience. Play for free today by clicking my link in the description below and unlock your exclusive bonus pack, available for new players and ones who were inactive for at least 6 months. Act quickly as the offer is only available for a limited time.